Welcome to Thrive with Pride from Age Options, an online space for LGBT older adults and those who care for them. This is a recording of a live event held on Zoom, which included a lively Q&A that we did not record. After you watch, please fill out a very short survey to help us improve our online programming. It is anonymous and will take you less than five minutes. The link to the survey is in the video description below. This month, we welcome John D'Amelio, PhD, a pioneer in the field of LGBTQ history and the history of sexuality, D'Amelio is a retired professor of gender and women's studies and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is the author or editor of almost a dozen books, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority in the United States, 1940 to 1970, Lost Prophet, The Life and Times of Bayard Rustin, and Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America, which was co-authored with Estelle B. Friedman and is now in its third edition. He recently served as president of the Gerber Hart Library and Archives in Chicago, and his newest book, Queer Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives, was published in 2020 by the University of Chicago Press. His memoir, Memories of a Gay Catholic Boyhood, Coming of Age in the 60s, will be published next year by Duke University Press. Links to the Gerber Hart Library and Archives and more of John's work are in the video description below. Um, uh, as Kate mentioned, I uh, was president of the board of the Gerber Hart Library and Archives, which is located in Rogers Park for the last three years. Um, but as a historian who's been researching and writing about LGBTQ history forever, uh, Gerber Hart has been a resource for me ever since I moved to Chicago more than 20 years ago. And it's been a great resource for many other people as well. So what I wanna do uh, in this bit of a talk is to tell you about it, uh, give you some background about its history, uh, how it's evolved, what it does, and what it has in its collections. And as I do this, um, I'll also be giving you bits and pieces of LGBTQ history. So uh, the first thing to know is that um, Gerber Hart is named after two historical figures. Uh, the first of them is Henry Gerber. Um, Gerber was a German immigrant. He, in the early 20th century, he served in the US Army during World War I. Uh, and was, you know, back in Germany. And he learned, when he was there, he learned about the gay movement in Germany, which Germany has had the earliest known gay rights movement that goes back to almost the turn of the last century. Uh, and in 1924, here in Chicago, he formed a group called the Society for Human Rights, which was the first known homosexual rights organization in the United States. Uh, an amazingly courageous thing to do. Uh, it also didn't last very long. He, it included just a few of his friends. Uh, in time, somebody reported it to the government and the authorities found out. Gerber was arrested. There was a front page article that exposed it. But still, uh, it makes him a historic figure that he was willing to do this. Uh, the other person uh, is Pearl Hart. And Pearl uh, Hart was a radical progressive lawyer at a time when there were very, very few women lawyers in the United States. Uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, she took on immigra immigrant rights cases among many others. And as early as the 1950s, she was probably the, one of the only lawyers in the Midwest, uh, and certainly in Chicago, who defended uh, gay men and lesbians and trans people who were arrested by the police in bar raids and on sex charges of various sorts. She often took on these cases pro bono, and the, her reputation was she was really a tough one and she was willing to take on the police and she rescued a lot of folks. So um, there, Gerber, Henry Gerber and Pearl Hart are two important historic figures. Uh, the Gerber Hart Library brought two projects together. Um, 
One was uh, something done by Greg Sprague, who in the late 70s was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And he was writing a dissertation on LGBTQ history at a time when almost no one in the US was doing something like this. He founds a group called the Chicago Gay and Lesbian History Project. He does research in newspapers and police records, um, in court cases. Um, he does oral histories of older folks in the community who can talk about the 40s, the 1930s, even the 1920s. Um, and he put together, uh, and this is before uh, PowerPoint, um, what was called in those days a slide lecture that he gave to a range of community and professional organizations, both in Chicago and in lots of other places as well. And this is a picture of, of the flyer uh, and a talk he gave in 1983 at the Second Unitarian Church. Um, now, around the same time that Greg was doing this, a group of folks uh, in the community came together uh, and put, uh, to put together an LGBTQ circulating library. And it's useful to remember that back in the late 1970s, LGBTQ books were not widely available. If you did find one in your local library or in a bookstore, it was almost like a coming out experience to buy it or to check it out. And many people, many folks were not willing to do that yet. And so the Circulating Library and the History Project came together in 1981 to found Gerber Hart, which is both a circulating library and a historical archive that's available to the public. So um, what does Gerber Hart do? Um, it still is a library with a wide range of books, uh, so many books on so many different topics. Uh, here is the display for National Poetry Month uh, in April, uh, Asian, Pacific, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, books on their LGBTQ experience, uh, a set of books on the economics of being gay, on job discrimination, um, what it means to come out at work and organize in a union if you're LGBTQ. Um, this is uh, for uh, Black History Month, uh, a series of books that are just part of the collection on uh, the experience of uh, African Americans. Uh, and, uh, you know, a major topic in the recent period, same-sex marriage and LGBTQ family, uh, a lot of books on this. Um, and I remember when I first encountered Gerber Harp, when I moved to Chicago in 99, even though I'd been working on LGBTQ history for a long time, my bookcases at home were filled with books on these topics, just walking up and down the aisles of uh, the library was a completely moving experience. Uh, it, it actually left me teary-eyed uh, since I had never seen anything like it before. And today, uh, Gerberhart still hosts student tours where teachers come with their classes. And, you know, even in this age of Kindle and eBooks and everything else, it still has a really powerful uh, impact on people. Um, the books circulate for free. There's no borrowing charge. Anybody can walk in. If you show an ID, you can borrow a book. Um, there's also, um, uh, whoops, wrong, wrong direction. Uh, the book collection comes entirely from donations from the community. Gerber Hart doesn't really have the budget to buy a lot of books. But one of the things that this means is that we get a lot of books that we already have. And so twice a year, there is a really big book sale where books go at a very cheap price, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I will mention, in case any of you come to Chicago or in Chicago. The next book sale is going to be Saturday, November 13th. So um, it's an opportunity. Um, anyway, what else? So times change. 
Uh, the library is still important, but it's become less central over time because there are so many books in print, so many people can easily get access to them. And at this point, it's impossible for Gerber Hart to even try to maintain a full collection of LGBTQ books. Over time, the archives have been getting more and more important. Uh, for one thing, they keep growing individuals in the community and organizations in the community donate their papers. Um, this is one aisle in the uh, archive room where the collections are stalled. Uh, it can look uh, very boring, all of these boxes on shelves. Um, at the moment, we have over 150 collections. And if you go to our website, there's a list of those collections and with descriptions of them. Most of the collections are from the 1960s forward, but some of them are earlier as well. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they reveal our history. Uh, the collections are open to researchers during our open hours and sometimes also by appointment. Users include high schoolers and college students, graduate students and academics, journalists, writers of historical fiction. Uh, Gerber Hart provides a prize each year to the city's Chicago Metro History Fair for the best student paper on LGBTQ history and that brings every year groups of college students, uh, high school students to the library to do research. Uh, the archives have led to some really wonderful books being published. Uh, for instance, uh, Queer Clout, uh, written by Timothy Stewart Winter. Uh, it's a study of uh, LGBTQ activism in Chicago from the 1950s through the 1990s. Another book is uh, Chicago Whispers, uh, which is uh, a history of LGBT Chicago before Stonewall, so uh, before 1969 and the birth of gay liberation. And the author, uh, Suki St. Delacroix, who was a journalist for a long time in the Chicago area, has done amazing research uncovering early documents. Another book, uh, before AIDS, gay health politics in the 1970s. And a major part of the book is the early history of Howard Brown, which is a Chicago-based organization. And the final book I'll mention is, if none of you have ever heard of it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a novel called The Great Believers. It's a historical novel set in Chicago that covers the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and the 1990s. And what all four of these books that I've mentioned have in common is that each one of the authors did a lot of their research at the Gerber Hart Library. So um, it, you know, the Gerber Hart Library leads to things, the archives, uh, produces books that then circulate uh, more widely. And I will say Gerber Hart operates out of the conviction in terms of its archives that history can really make a difference. Uh, it can be a force for change. History has been used in cases that challenged successfully state sodomy laws. His, uh, history was used to make the argument in marriage equality cases. Uh, court briefs were submitted by historians. So the work that Gerber Hart is doing in preserving the records of Chicago area and Midwestern LGBTQ history is very important. Now, another, besides books, another major piece of Gerber Hart's work today is that it does exhibits and makes this his history available to a broader public beyond those people who do the research and write history. Over the last few years, we've had several different exhibits that we've mounted and that are displayed at our site. And I will give you a, a little bit of a sense of them. 
One of them was an exhibit on Anita Bryant and the Dade County campaign of 1977. Uh, in 1977, Dade County, Florida passed an anti-discrimination ordinance and Anita Bryant, who was a popular singer, a former beauty queen, and also was a representative in commercials for the Florida citrus industry, she organizes a group called Save Our Children which does, uh, which mounts uh, a voter referendum repeal campaign that is successful in 1977 in repealing that non-discrimination ordinance. And she then goes around the country reporting on this and organizing other cities with anti-discrimination ordinances to do the same thing and repeal them. Um, it leads to quite an upsurge in activism uh, within the LGBT community uh, it, because she's making it a national campaign. And so this was an anti-Anita flyer. Uh, one, year, one month when she was speaking in Iowa about her Save the Children campaign, uh, a, an activist sitting in the room ra raced forward and threw a pie in her face. Um, this is a, a, a photo of outside the Medina Temple, which was in the near north section of Chicago. When Anita came here to speak in 1977, it created the largest LGBTQ demonstration that Chicago had yet seen. So that was kind of one, dem one exhibit. A second exhibit uh, was about Danny Sotomayor who was a Chicago AIDS activist in the 80s and early 90s, who was also a political cartoonist. And uh, he began creating cartoons that exposed the injustice of the political system in terms of dealing with the AIDS epidemic. And they circulated very widely in the LGBTQ press around the United States. Uh, here is a community of um, President Bush uh, and uh, his wife. Anything important in the paper, dear? Nope, even though the headline says 100,000 diagnosed with AIDS. Um, here is one uh, that is uh, taking issue with the Catholic Church and its unwillingness to uh, embrace people with AIDS. Um, and you know, America responds to AIDS. How do they respond? A mass of, of coffins. Um, another exhibit that we did uh, was about drag performance in Chicago, uh, especially using uh, photographs that we received from one of the great drag performers over several decades in Chicago uh, named uh, Miss Tilly. Uh, drag performance um, was a major early form of visibility. Uh, for the community. Uh, in the, for instance, in the, as early as the 1920s and 1930s, there are major clubs on Chicago's South Side uh, that are doing uh, drag performance. Uh, some of the leading drag performers in the United States were Chicago-based performers, African-Americans and the like. Uh, anyway, we did an exhibit uh, using Miss Tilly's, uh, this is a picture of her, uh, of her photographs. Uh, this is her a bit older. Um, and it included a lot of other material. Uh, here's a cover of Gay Chicago magazine from 1980 with a photo of a drag performer. Uh, uh, here's a collection of several different drag performers uh, from uh, the late, uh, I believe 1880s, maybe 1890s. Um, we, uh, a lot of this material, we have an, uh, Gerber Hart has an Instagram uh, page uh, and we, there's a feature called tu uh, Tilly Tuesdays in which every Tuesday something, a photo from her collection is posted. Another exhibit was on what is called lesbian pulp fiction. In the 1950s, uh, when there was very little positive portrayal of LGBTQ life in, in the culture, the most common form of representing LGBTQ life was something called 
pulp novels. These were very, very cheap novels. They sold for like 35 cents each. You could find them in drugstores, uh, in um, uh, on newspaper stands, in bookstores. And the over, and some of them sold millions of copies, but the overwhelming majority of them were incredibly negative. Uh, they, uh, the, they were written by heterosexual men exploiting uh, lesbians for, to arouse the sexual passions of heterosexual men. So here's one, look at the title, Warped, Twisted Passions in the Twilight World, or The Twisted Ones. Um, you know, so uh, Gerber Hart did a, a display of them, but also including in that display the work of Val Valerie Taylor, who is a Chicago-based novelist in the 50s and uh, 60s, who used the pulp genre to write positive novels about lesbian uh, experience. So Whisper Their Love, The Girls in 3B, a World Without Men. Here's one of the covers of her novels. It doesn't have any of that negative connotation, those words attached to it. Uh, some of the other things that Gerberhart has, you know, in its collections, if we move beyond the exhibits, um, a huge amount of periodicals from the LGBTQ press. Uh, the latter, which goes back to the 1950s and early 60s. Uh, notice, however, it's, uh, it's a period of time where the community displayed caution, so nothing says lesbian. Uh, but by the 1970s and gay liberation, you have a periodical like Lavender Woman uh, proclaiming lesbian pride. Uh, we have a collection of Gay Chicago from the 1970s and early 80s, probably the most widely circulated periodical at the time. Uh, Black Lines, uh, which was produced uh, in the 1990s uh, by the African-American LGBTQ community in Chicago. Uh, newsletters uh, produced by bisexual organizations. So um, a lot of material. And, I'll include one more. The Chicago Gay Crusader uh, was a, a newspaper published for a few years in the 70s. And I have to say, I think this is the favorite headline that I've ever seen. Uh, 20 million gay people cured. And what the article is, is that the American Psychiatric Association had uh, dropped the uh, sickness classification of homosexuality. Um, besides these kinds of periodicals, we also have a large collection of what are, were called physique magazines in the 50s and 60s. And these, these were bodybuilding magazines. They weren't gay in any way, but they, gay men were among the main audience for this because it was a place in which attractive male bodies were displayed. Uh, some other things that we have, uh, we, we have what are called artifacts, and one form of that are millions, that, well, not millions, but many, many thousands of buttons that have been issued uh, by organizations and for events in the LGBTQ and feminist community. Here you can see some of them more closely. Uh, closets are health hazards. Homophobia can be cured with education. I wasn't recruited, I enlisted, um, uh, and uh, anyway, you, you can just sort of see the, uh, what they uh, represent. Uh, we also have posters going back in time. Uh, this is one from 1980 for the first national black lesbian conference uh, that was ever held. Um, so I hope this gives you some sense of what Gerber Hart does and what it has available. Um, it's, Gerberhardt is located uh, in the Rogers Park neighborhood. Uh, it has limited hours, Wednesday and Thursday in the evening, Friday, Saturday, uh, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning and afternoon. Uh, its website is uh, very easily accept, accessible, gerberhardt.org. You can visit the website and sign on to the mailing list 
I promise you will not get inundated with email. You'll probably get at most three emails a month with a newsletter. But one of the uh, positive side effects of the pandemic, so to speak, is that because Gerber Hart had to be closed to the public for quite a number of months, it began putting more and more material on its website. So if you were to go to the website, you would see the content of quite a number of the exhibits that Gerber Hart has put up in the last few years. And um, I will just end with a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, uh, Kate mentioned this when she was introducing me, but my most recent book uh, was uh, published last year is called Queer Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives. And it has 38 chapters, each one of which is a self-contained story about Chicago LGBTQ history, about a person, about an event, an organization. And all of those, each one of those chapters was based on research that I was able to do uh, in the Gerber Hart Library. So, uh, so let me stop here and uh, leave the slideshow and say that I am um, um, open to questions uh, and comments that you might have. Um, Thanks again to John D'Amelio for a fascinating presentation. Don't forget to take a look at the video description below for more information about Gerber Hart Library and Archives. We've included links to follow them on social media where you can see more photographs of their historical treasures and a link to John's newest book on LGBT history in Chicago. Please join us for our next monthly event on November 23rd, 2021, when we'll be hearing from Michael Stone, legal director of the Center for Disability and Elder Law. Mr. Stone will present on the advanced planning documents every LGBT older adult needs, as well as resources available through the center to help you plan ahead to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your assets. Thank you again for watching and please fill out the brief survey below.